Okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Hadley German and I am the Eugene B. Adkins Curator here at the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art. Before we get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping for you today. We have muted all of our attendees' microphones, but you are welcome to post comments or questions to our uh, curators throughout their presentation today. You can do so by typing in your question or comment into the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom window. And our curators will respond to your questions at the end of the program today. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's webinar held in conjunction with the exhibition, A Life in Looking, the Creighton Gilbert Collection. This exhibition, which opened just yesterday, highlights key works in the collection of Creighton Gilbert, one of the 20th century's foremost scholars of Renaissance art. Gilbert had ties to Oklahoma through his former student at Yale, Dr. Eric Lee, who many of you know as a previous director of the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art, and also as the current director of the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth. And I believe Eric may be joining us today. So thank you, Eric, for fostering a relationship between the FJJMA and Dr. Gilbert which resulted in his bequest of 272 paintings, drawings, and prints to the museum in 2011. Also, I want to take a moment to thank the Creighton Gilbert estate, in particular, Stephen Gilbert, Creighton's nephew, for funding the conservation of major works in the collection. Many of those paintings have only recently arrived back in Norman following conservation. And as a result, they are on view for the first time in this exhibition. So you're all in for a real treat. Stephen Gilbert was also generous in sharing his uncle's books and archival materials with the museum. And we've made facsimiles of a number of those objects, which you can browse in the exhibition's learning and engagement space. Thank you, Stephen, for your generosity, which has truly made this exhibition possible. I would be remiss if I didn't also thank our other former students of Gilbert's, particularly Alexander Nemirov and David Byron, who were so helpful to us as we organized this exhibition. We're glad to have you with us today. For any of our attendees who are students of, of Dr. Gilbert, we hope you'll post a comment in the Q&A box and, and let us know you're here, but also let us know your preferred contact information. We're organizing a celebration that will occur midway through the exhibition's run, probably in October, and we'd love to invite you to the festivities. Last but not least, I want to thank our guest curators and today's speakers, Drs. Aaron Duncan O'Neill and Allison Palmer. Without their enthusiasm and knowledge, this exhibition could not have been possible. So without further ado, I'll give you an introduction to today's speakers. Erin Duncan O'Neill is an assistant professor at the OU School of Visual Arts, specializing in 19th century European art with a focus on 19th century France. After earning a BA in art history at the University of California, Berkeley, and a master's in education at Arizona State, she completed her PhD in art history at Princeton in 2016. Dr. O'Neill's research focuses on print culture, politics, and censorship in art. Her current book project, In Jest, Literary Satire and the Art of Honoré Daumier, investigates the influence of literary and theatrical satire in the artist's painting, sculptures, and prints. Alison Palmer is a professor of art history in the School of Visual Arts at the University of Oklahoma. She received her BA in Art History from Mount Holyoke and her MA and PhD from Rutgers with a focus on European Renaissance and Baroque art and architecture. Dr. Palmer currently teaches undergraduate and graduate courses for the College of Professional and Continuing, oh, excuse me, <laughs> in European art from the Renaissance through the 18th century, humanities courses for the College of Professional and Continuing Studies and Italian art courses for OU summer in Italy programs. Her research focuses on patronage in late medieval and early Renaissance Italy and Roman Baroque art and architecture. So please uh, join me in a warm Zoom welcome for Erin and Allison. I'll let you both take it away. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate this. Erin um, and I will both be talking a little bit about Creighton Gilbert first and then showing you a selection from the collection. And we certainly hope that you'll come and see the full collection of about 80 works of art that are on display through the end of December uh, at the Fred Jones Museum. So when we were putting together some ideas for this, um, 
Uh, it was really interesting because uh, Creighton Gilbert himself is both an art historian and a collector, which is how we came across this name, A Life in Looking, um, because we wanted to look at him as both a scholar and to see how his scholarship and his special focus in Italian Renaissance art really kind of shaped uh, the collection of art uh, that he donated to the Fred Jones Museum. Uh, this is a photograph of him. If you come to the museum, you'll see a number of images in the study section. Uh, this photograph is probably in the Huntingdon Gardens uh, during a trip he took uh, to the College Art Association, which is the annual uh, National College of Art Historians that he was very involved in. Um, and when you go to the study section, you'll see other photographs and drawings. There is a sketch of Creighton Gilbert, a sketch of his mother, and then there's a large photograph uh, that Stephen Gilbert took of his father, uh, Everett, on display there, as well as some other memorabilia. So look at that very carefully, because it's really interesting to know something about the collector. We don't always have the opportunity to really introduce um, the motivations and the ideas behind how a collection comes about. Um, so in the next image, uh, we know um, Creighton Gilbert. Oh, here, yes, we see on the left, you can see the photograph. And then when you look at the books in that corner, um, the collection also has a number of his books. He published widely uh, throughout his career. He had about a 50 year career. Um, and so you can peruse some of those books as well as scans and copies of his personal documents that are on display by that desk. The right image shows a journal of his, and this is really interesting because this journal he wrote when he was 12 years old. Uh, both of his parents were uh, scholars. His father, Alan Gilbert, and his mother, Catherine Everett, met in graduate school. They both received their PhDs at Cornell and settled at Duke University. Um, and his mother, in particular, was the first a uh, woman who was able to achieve a full professorship. Uh, so um, both of his parents were academics in English, Renaissance studies, his mother in philosophy and classics. And so he developed a very early interest in Italian art. He, together with his older brother, Everett, the family traveled to Europe. The first time they toured Europe was in 1930 when Creighton was about six years old. And then they traveled again when he was 12 years old. He was quite a prodigy studying Greek and Latin growing up. And so he had actually finished the high school curriculum uh, at his school in Durham, North Carolina by the time he was 12 years old. And so his parents decided to take him to Europe um, and take a year off so that he would be a little bit older once he entered university. So he was 12 when he went to settle in Florence and study at Miss Barry's Foreign School in Florence. There's such an interesting history about his youth and childhood that David Byron wrote in his biography of Creighton Gilbert, and that's been it's called Creighton Gilbert Living Art History. Uh, living art history. And that was a, was a great resource for us. And I think the ideas that Byron spoke about um, in his biography, you can really see in uh, in this journal. So um, Creighton at the age of 12, what you can do when you go to the gallery, you can kind of flip the pages here that are on the screen. It's a TV screen on that right slide. You can flip the pages and read little segments of his itinerary, of some of his teachers, some of the things he did. And it's so funny because he's 12 years old, but you can tell how mature he is. And it was at this time period when he became interested in Michelangelo. OK, um, and so his family toured Europe until 1938, uh, so almost two years uh, when he was 13 years old. And at that point, he could return back home and enroll at Duke University as a special student. So he was already completing a college curriculum at the age of 13, where he first studied classics. OK, um, and take a moment to read through some of the page of his journals, because he really has a really critical mind, even at the age of 12. He talks about some of his teachers, 
uh, at this school in Florence and a lot of that. And, and then he talks about Michelangelo. He talks about the places he visits in Italy and you can really see it, the, the development of his young mind and his, his beautiful handwriting, wonderful ideas. He's a great prodigy, even at that young age, it emerges in that, in that uh, journal. So he studied at Duke until 1940 when he transferred to Johns Hopkins. Um, and it, it may be, um, Byron mentions that this is because Charles Singleton, who is a Dante specialist, was there at Johns Hopkins. And so he was studying classics at this time period, but then he switched to cl from classics to art history. And this is a really interesting time period for the development of art history as a discipline as well, because art history was so young um, in the 20s, 30s, and then 40s. Um, and the earliest art historians were German, Burkhardt, Wufflin, uh, and the earliest programs were at Princeton and Harvard in the late 1800s. And they really led the way for the establishment of art history as its own separate discipline. It grows out of philosophy, out of classics, out of all of these areas that he studied at such a young age. So he moved from, he developed an interest in art history and moved to the Institute of Fine Arts where their program was very new um, and uh, received his degree at the age of 18 and went on NYU to receive his master's degree uh, before beginning his teaching career at Emory when he was 23 years old. Um, from that point, he was completing his PhD and uh, uh, and kind of moving around. He uh, taught also at Louisville. Um, and these are really interesting places where he taught Louisville uh, and then Brandeis. Uh, and then he settled at Yale in 1981. But in his youth, he wrote a lot of book reviews and helped organize museum exhibitions. and. And some of that you can see in his collection because some of these works he began to collect in the 1940s. His earliest collections are not the Italian Renaissance paintings that we so equate with his collection, but some contemporary works, some prints, things that were on display at the Height Museum. Um, and so what he sought to do during this time period as an academic, he really tried to improve sort of the rigor and the professionalism of the discipline of art history. Um, and so uh, he had some feuds with other art historians, including Charles de Tolnoy over his translations of Michelangelo, uh, because Gil Gilbert himself uh, published on Michelangelo. And if we can go to the next slide, um, we can see his uh, publications. Th these are just three books of his. Um, again, look at that shelf when you go to the museum and you can see some of his other works, but his History of Renaissance Art, first published 1972 and then 73, um, that is a classic, a standard textbook that was used for many years. Um, and then the next book is his Michelangelo collection of essays. This one uh, is from 1994. So it collects a lot of his early essays on Michelangelo called On and Off the Sistine Ceiling. And then finally, more recently is his Fra Angelico and Signorelli research that dates 2002. Uh, this was published by Penn State and it uh, kind of showcases the um, a chapel in Orvieto Cathedral uh, in Italy, where he really kind of promotes this idea that Fra Angelico um, uh, sort of oversaw the original designs and so forth that Signorelli later in the 1400s completed. So these are just a number of his an, an incredible list of publications, articles, exhibition catalogs, book reviews, books, monographs, textbooks throughout his career as well as his publication of Michelangelo's poetry um, that he was very, very interested in. He was interested, he wrote his own poetry as well and early on uh, thought to become a poet. So his own sort of background in that uh, really helped um, kind of fuel his, his interests. Um, so if we can go to the next slide then. Um, uh, essentially, this is the, the collection then. So once he uh, was established at Yale University, uh, he continued to travel extensively um, and uh, he spent the rest of his career until his death in uh, 2011. And this is where uh, Eric Lee, the former director of the Fred Jones Museum of Art, took classes with Creighton Gilbert, among many other alumni, uh, a whole generation of art historians he trained 
obtained uh, and and then ultimately donating the collection to the Fred Jones Museum so we can begin to look a little bit more in detail at his uh, research interests as well as his collecting spirit. Um, so uh, Aaron will take over here and talk a little bit about how we kind of formulated this exhibition. So we had really um, a, a wealth of artworks to choose from. And it was a really fun process uh, to go through the collection very carefully and, and really choose our favorites, um, you know, as an organizing principle, you know, what, what were the most fabulous pieces, um, the most interesting. And we decided to organize the exhibition into five themes, uh, religion, architecture, allegory, portraiture, and humor uh, to represent his, his broad collecting interests. Um, these often intersect with uh, themes sort of emerging from the Italian Renaissance uh, or ideas emerging, emerging from his specialties, um, but they were also influenced, as Allison said, by uh, Gilbert's broader um, curatorial practice. Um, he curated many shows, um, as she said, at the University of Kentucky and also did a brief stint at the Ringling Museum in Sarasota um, and, and was a, a sort of dedicated curator um, for that uh, somewhat brief period. Um, so the religion section um, has some of the most impressive paintings um, in the collection. And, and so as you walk into the show, you start with this um, picturing Catholicism the section. Uh, because Creighton Gilbert specialized in the art of the Italian Renaissance, we see, of course, a, a strong familiarity with um, artworks expressing devotion to Roman Catholicism. Um, and uh, the emergence of humanism in the Renaissance contributed to the popularity of some of the scenes you see on this slide. Uh, the Madonna and Child paintings, um, uh, scenes of young Christ with the saints. Um, and we see Creighton Gilbert collecting this kind of imagery um, in painting and in prints. Uh, and sometimes with uh, slightly unusual iconography, um, uh, as, and we can sort of sense him puzzling through um, new iconography or trying to sort of place paintings that don't have attributions. Um, so this is really, you can see the sort of wealth of his experience, um, especially in, uh, in the later years when he's collecting these paintings, um, you know, thinking he can kind of solve these puzzles um, with artworks that don't have attributions. Um, there's also, uh, we organize uh, an, another section um, into sort of nature and architecture. Um, and we, we had a lot of images to choose from here. He has this incredible print collection um, in addition to some landscape paintings um, that we've, that we've uh, shown in this exhibition. And uh, images of architectural monuments and the natural world are re were really powerful, uh, especially in the 17th and 18th centuries at transporting viewers in time and space, right? Viewers who um, did not have the opportunity to travel or um, acting as mementos for travels, especially the sort of grand tour that was uh, emerging in this period. So we see prints from the 17th centuries, the 18th century, um, of all types, um, uh, sort of transporting the, the viewer now um, and also um, contemporaneously um, uh, to see sort of poetic uh, architectural ruins, the apses of distant churches um, and, uh, and, and landscapes uh, of, of foreign spaces too. Um, some of this uh, we sort of sensed there is a kind of um, melancholy or nostalgia that kind of haunts the some of the imagery in this section. Um, these sort of ruins um, uh, were inspired by new archaeological excavations that were happening in the late 18th century. Um, so you have this kind of aesthetic of ruination. Um, and then for, for landscapes, um, th that's a fairly nostalgic genre too. We often see um, landscape emerging as a popular genre during periods of intense social change. So industrialization um, or urbanization, uh, landscapes become this really popular um, uh, genre uh, to sort of ease that kind of transition with images of bucolic leisure. Um, so we have these represented as well. 
Um, we also have a section, uh, I'm just showing you sort of a general view here, of allegory and myth. And it's a smaller part of the exhibition, but a really um, sort of powerful moment. And again, this is connected to Italian Renaissance interests and to Gilbert's um, specialization. Um, of course, in the Renaissance, we see increasingly sophisticated interpretations of the literature and visual arts um, coming out of classical antiquity. And this includes, you know, mythology and allegory. Um, so we see Renaissance thinkers, you know, interpreting these and reinterpreting um, mythology and allegory here, um, often with moralizing messages. And so you'll see in the exhibition, um, uh, the figure of Nemesis, the seven deadly sins, allegories of peace and summer, um, and even a, uh, a Picasso um, print illustrating a modern edition of Ovid's Metamorphoses. So it's, it's a, an exciting sort of uh, moment in the exhibition. We also have, um, to end with our two final um, sections, uh, our portraiture and figure studies, and then caricature and humor, and these sort of blend into each other. Um, and portraits and figure studies, we see a real exciting diversity. I think Allison would, would agree with me in types of portraits and figure studies, really ranging from, you know, specific, um, uh, anatomical studies to more idealized abstract studies and we have drawings, we have prints of various kinds, we have paintings. Um, and so uh, the bequest um, really contains numerous examples of uh, portraits and figure studies, which of course um, uh, have been really the basis for much artistic inspiration, um, you know, from antiquity to the Renaissance and to the present day. Um, this section also includes uh, humor and caricature, um, maybe my favorite <laughs> part of the show. Um, humorous images, cartoons, caricatures, um, these have really been popular since the inventing of the printing press um, and even before. Um, and that's because uh, visual satire can appeal to audiences, um, especially in the sort of democratic um, media of pr medium of print um, can appeal to audiences that that aren't necessarily literate right um, and in terms of Creighton Gilbert's uh, special interest in humor and caricature um, uh, he he tends to have a preference for um, social satire so um, uh, satires mocking the sort of um, uh, common failings and daily irritations of human beings and and these would have been real uh, sort of fabulous things to find um, uh, likely on his travels um, in Europe, sort of flea market finds um, or exciting uh, pieces. And we'll, we'll get into these um, a little bit uh, in, in more detail. Um, but one thing we were really proud about in organizing this exhibition is that um, the, our, our, the way we hung the exhibition, the sort of um, spacing between objects, the, the way it's organized aesthetically um, really aligns with Creighton Gilbert's aesthetic choices. So we, we have exhibition reviews by him, including a show um, of works from the Vatican at the Met from 1982. And he stated a preference for hanging objects according to theme and acquisition instead of, you know, just a chronological um, line. Um, and also he uh, stated a preference for sort of airing out uh, objects, so giving space between objects. Um, uh, he thought that that was really effective for the appreciation of artworks, kind of giving them breathing room. He called, um, he said that he wanted the works to appear as exclamation marks in the space. And so that's one thing we're proud of with the organization of this is that um, we really feel like we're, we're giving the, the, the due um, or appreciation to these objects. And so we'll get into the objects. We've just picked a couple um, of our favorites to, to chat about today, um, and we'll sort of switch off uh, one by one. Okay. 
Um, thank you. So uh, there are throughout the exhibition particular works of art that are highlighted um, with different uh, thematic kinds of issues and some of those we're showing today and then some of the other ones we're showing as well just a selection and overview. And so we'll begin with this painting by Girolamo da Romano whose name is also called Romanino or Little Romano. Uh, Madonna and Child was Saint Jerome. Um, this is an interesting painting. Um, that uh, Creighton Gilbert was really doing a lot of research on himself. He has an article uh, that is uh, called Portraits by and near Romanino that he published in an Italian journal in 1959. And so it was at that time period that he really began to try to suss out the different stylistic kind of distinctions between a lot of these Northern Italian artists, because it's interesting that his uh, own research uh, focuses on Michelangelo and other central Italian artists, but his collecting uh, is more focused focused on Northern Italian painters. Um, and so Romanino was from a town called Brescia in the region of Lombardy. Uh, Lombardy, the seat of that is Milan in Northern Italy. And this is a relatively small devotional panel that's a half-length for, uh, half format image. And it has uh, the Virgin kind of tilting her head, looking out toward us with the uh, Christ child squirming on her lap. But what makes it kind of unique is it has um, this figure of St. Jerome behind with a, holding a cross, which is a constant reminder of one's uh, salvation after death by uh, using the crucifix as a kind of a devotional object. So this whole painting then is a devotional object. And stylistically, it's really aligned with Northern Italian artists, Titian, Giorgione, those who use a softer kind of a brush brushwork. Um, um, and even with Leonardo's paintings that have this dark kind of monochromatic uh, background, this softness or haziness is called sfumato in Italian. And that's something that we see in a lot of the paintings that uh, Gilbert collected. Um, he dated this painting to the 1520s. And when we were doing research, one thing that we were kind of looking at was um, the attributions of these paintings and uh, looking at the dating. Some of them he was able to discern uh, artistic styles and dates and others uh, were works he was still doing research on. Um, and this particular one he dated to the 1520s. So I went and looked at some of his other works from that same era. And he has a painting, St. Matthew and the Angel for a, a church in Brescia. Uh, San Giovanni Evangelista that is from exactly the same time period. And certainly this is the work that Creighton Gilbert saw and uh, determined these two paintings to be from the same decade because stylistically they're very, very similar. And interestingly enough, this sort of dark setting background anticipates the dark tenebristic qualities of the later Baroque Italian artist Caravaggio, who is a Lombard artist uh, from, the, from the town called Caravaggio, um, and introduce that kind of dark background in his paintings that he completed in Rome. So in many ways, uh, Roman, Romanino or Romano um, uh, was uh, an artist who was really sort of forward thinking in his uh, uh, style. Now, this painting is interesting with the Saint Jerome. This is one of the paintings that uh, received conservation. So if we could look at the next slide, this is also uh, on display in the gallery. And so there were about 12 paintings that were conserved and conservation practices are very time intensive, very expensive, and there are not a whole lot of conservation studios uh, in the United States, but we're very lucky here in Oklahoma that Dallas and the Kimball and Fort Worth both have conservation students studios and each of those did, uh, conserved uh, six of these works of arts. Um, and so at this time period we also uh, had to think about um, framing for these works um, and so part of the bequest provided funding also for replica frames of the era um, that were done 
uh, and then another beautiful frame, a tabernacle frame uh, from the 19th century uh, as well on one of the paintings. So as you look at the exhibition, of, of course, you know, these images just so the conservation reports, but look at the beautiful frames as well, because on the labels we kind of denote uh, which ones have these replica frames. So this one, um, there's also these really interesting conservation reports that you can look at for these paintings. And so we wanted to highlight that and, and uh, one of them. And um, Eric Lee is at the Kimball Museum now. So not only did he help uh, get this bequest in Oklahoma, but he also was at the Kimball uh, um, uh, beginning in uh, 2009. And so this whole conservation process that was just completed this year uh, um, really took place during this time period. And so um, the Romanino is one of them that offers a really interesting kind of uh, examination and treatment report um, that shows us the detailed job of art conservation. Um, another thing um, that I just wanted to add was that Yale University has a technical institute for uh, for art history that was uh, really established in uh, 2011. It's really, um, uh, you know, the, the year that uh, um, Creighton Gilbert died was the year they established this institute that has original pigments, has a lot of the equipment um, that they uh, use to help kind of figure out the best way to conserve and to examine these works of art. So in this particular um, report, um, what you can see, uh, be, it begins with a sort of an X-ray, an X-radiography uh, um, to kind of look at the state of the work. Uh, if there's water damage, if there's damage around the top, it's removed from the frame, as you can see here, all around the four edges, uh, these panels are removed from the frame. Sometimes we've got canvas, sometimes you have wood panels. Um, and then with infrared uh, reflectography, this shows the underdrawing and the layers of paint because with oil paint, this is oil and panel, with oil paint, you can layer the pigment which you can't do with temper paint in the same way. So you can see the layering. Um, and then if you look at the x-ray under fluorescence, it, you can also help to figure out what the original chemical compositions of the colors are. And that helps you figure out the date of the work. Uh, so for example, if it's a lead-based white, that's not used today, um, but a lot of these pigments, I mean, this was a time period before you have um, sort of manufactured colors. They're all ground pigments by hand. They're elements, you know, azurite and the red that you use is a um, you know, you, you have them elements, you have uh, these uh, um, semi-precious stones and so forth that are used for, for pigments. Um, and so that can help you date the work to see if the chemical compositions are consistent with the kind of color recipes that were used and materials that were available during this time period. Okay, um, and so also then when you can clean these works, a lot of the layers of varnish that are applied later can be taken off so you can see some of the original colors. And what you find with this x-ray scan is that the position of St. Jerome was changed. There's a couple of photographs that show that his, that his face was sort of tilted upward. And so with oil paint, you can actually paint over and make compositional kind of changes. And so it's thought that his, maybe his head was tilted up to accommodate his beard. Sometimes attributions can even change when you do these kinds of x-rays. Um, so th um, the artist Rembrandt, who's also featured in this exhibition, was very well known in his paintings for changing uh, his, uh, his, uh, um, compositions. And that's why you get a lot of x-rays of Rembrandt's works. But it's really interesting to x-ray some of these earlier uh, paintings and really see uh, some of the uh, changes that took place and strip off the varnish and have an opportunity to really um, see the luminosity of these original oil pigments. So when you go to the exhibition, take a very good look um, at uh, these photographs as well as the painting, and you can also read in more detail the conservation report. Okay. 
Um, so we can go to the next slide, Erin. So one painting where uh, the this kind of detailed conservation report um, increased the mystery instead of demystified the artwork uh, is this very strange and wonderful painting, which I think we both really love. Um, this is the, a portrait of an organist, um, a title that's you know, descriptive. Um, it didn't emerge from the paint, you know, it, we didn't get the title. We don't know who the um, artist is. Uh, we know that Gilbert um, really tried to establish an attribution for this, this uh, strange and sort of um, uh, really compelling work. Uh, but we think it's around the 16th or 17th century, probably in Italy, um, either Verona or um, Cremona. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's this sort of wonderful and strange uh, painting of a man um, with a fur-lined coat, right, playing an organ with a landscape over his shoulder, a sort of indistinct landscape. Um, and what really draws your eye, uh, besides this compelling face, are these very stiff hands, right, um, that are uh, playing the organ. They, they seem sort of awkward and stilted. Um, and what the conservation report revealed, um, which you might intuit as the viewer looking at it now, is that um, the hands, um, especially the fingertips, have been overpainted. And so it's unclear actually from these um, X-ray fluorescent you know, reports, um, whether those were original. So whether the fingertips, the position of the hands and the organ itself was original to the painting. So this might have been uh, an example of a canvas that was uh, sort of transformed over time. Um, and, and to serve a new purpose, right? To give a new um, identity to, to an existing sitter. Um, so we found this really interesting. And, and also in terms of the collector's view, you know, this would have been a real exciting puzzle for an art historian of Creighton Gilbert's um, knowledge and background um, and, and would have appealed to him perhaps. Um, this also shows a theme of music um, that we see linked to um, other works in the collection in various media, um, both in secular and devotional contexts. So it was clear that music was, was important or a sort of interest um, to Creighton Gilbert. Okay, this next work is a small painting and it hangs on the wall by itself so that you can really focus on this intricate uh, narrative. Um, this is attributed to the workshop of an artist named Domenico Panetti who was active in Ferrara um, and it, it has stylistic similarities to a lot of Venetian painters, Giovanni uh, Bellini and Cima da Cornigliano in this soft modeling of the background and and this early use of oil pigments we find in Venice. Um, and so it's thought then that it depicts um, a central panel of what could have been a small triptych that originally might have had uh, side panels that sort of fold in, in which case it would have been somewhat portable. And it's an interesting subject because it shows the adoration of the Christ child with Joseph kind of walking in for, from our left side. Uh, and then you have the Virgin kneeling to the Christ child on the ground, which is a Northern uh, European format, having the Christ on the ground. But then the two figures on the right are uh, the Archangel Raphael, who leads uh, the young Tobias, a young little boy, Tobias sort of pointing and leading him toward the Virgin Mary. And so what we see, this is not part of the overall nativity, but it's a conflation of two different stories. In the Hebrew book of Tobit, um, the story is told about how um, uh, Raphael helps the young T Tobias, um, takes him to get some fish, to make an ointment, to cure his father Tobit's blindness. Um, and so as they sort of travel on the way, we, um, we, we see the development of this iconography where Raphael becomes this healer, but also a protector of travelers. Um, and Raphael was popular in Venice, a port city where the merchants traveled widely. Um, and so he came to be known as a 
protector specifically of merchants traveling by sea. And so the whole symbolism really fits with the context in Venice. And you can see how a patron might commission this work, perhaps even as a portable piece uh, to protect them along their trade routes, okay? Um, so take a close look at that. And then the next work um, is another really interesting uh, set of images. Um, these are curved panels and these are in the study. Um, these, when you look at, they're both uh, together. This is from a group of six of these uh, Lombard male and female heads that appear under an arch and they're, and they're um, placed on in a pedestal today, but they would have originally been hung up on the ceiling along the cornice of a domestic palace. Um, so these also come from Lombardy and it's thought that they are from the circle of a family of painters, um, the Bembo family, and there are actually some of these palaces in Cremona and Crema uh, where um, some early photos show these panels before they were all disassembled. So Crate and Gilbert, um, it's interesting because when you first look at these, you think where, you know, where on earth would these have been from? They're part of a larger uh, sort of a context. And Crate and Gilbert did some research on this and noted that there's over 50 of these panels. There's some in the Victorian Albert, some in the Gardner Museum in Boston. So I went to these museum websites and looked up and indeed each of these have similar sets um, and their own kind of research on the Bembo family. Uh, and so they would have been um, alternating a female head and a male head, female head, and then in between you would have maybe coats of arms or other heraldic symbols or devices. So they would have functioned as kind of a wall frieze beneath the ceiling, part of the molding that connects to the wall, which is why you get that curvature to them. So they also wear these aristocratic outfits that were in fact in the Lombard fashion. So it's clear that they're from Lombardy and they look down, some of them look down from this balcony. So they would have looked down into kind of a, a large banquet room or another room where people would have, guests would have been uh, entertained. Um, and so the panels when they're made, since they're curved, they would have been, the wood panels would have been soaked in water and bent into this curved shape uh, and then painted on so that you can see them from an angle below. Um, now these are interesting because they're from the late 15th century and indeed the ones in the other museums are from the same date as well, late 1400s, 1480s, 90s, but they've been repainted up through the 19th century. Um, so they're in fairly good shape, but they have a lot of repainting on them through uh, sort of the late 19th century as well. And that's the kind of thing that Creighton Gilbert was trying to tease out, you know, what is the original part of these works? Um, where did they end up? What is the provenance? What was the early context of these? So all of that is a much bigger picture uh, in addition to the artist's name and the date of these works, but also how they functioned. Um, okay, so we can move on to this next painting. Uh, this wonderful painting, um, it's a bit small, it looks probably big on your screen. And this is a painting made after Annabale Karachi, uh, Two Laughing Youths. Um, it's it's a, a kind of study in expression um, and uh, a, a kind of artist's uh, project or puzzle. So um, it was very typical up to up through the 19th century for artists to make copies of existing paintings in order as part of their training. And so this is what we're seeing. We're seeing um, a 19th century copy of a work by um, Annabale Karachi. This sort of, again, interesting um, exploration, not only of hair, but you know, what are what do laughing eyes look like? Um, how is a face scrunched? Um, when, you know, a joke is shared, this sort of great figure study. And the paint has, uh, is lead-based, the white paint is lead-based, so we think it's uh, late 19th century, so we can date it uh, more precisely. Um, and in terms of intersecting with Creighton Gilbert's interest, um, uh, 
Uh, Karachi was an important figure for the revival of caricature in, uh, in modern art. Um, caricature is the process of exaggerating portraits for comic effect. And you can see some of that in this painting. I'm also going to show you um, a, a drawing by uh, Karachi of caricature heads in profile. This is a sort of um, important object uh, that lives at the British Museum. Um, and the term uh, caricatura in Italian um, uh, appeared in relation to Italian art around 1600 through the work of Karachi. Um, and this is a moment where, that Allison knows a lot about, this is a moment in art, right, after proportions were thought to be really perfected, right, by uh, and idealized by artists of the high Italian Renaissance. Um, and so artists that came after were sort of challenged by this, you know, aesthetic and geometric perfection. And Karachi and his circle uh, focused on a grittier form of naturalism. Um, so they were committed to observation and uh, uh, Karachi founded the, the Academy of the Progressives to sort of make this, uh, to codify this philosophy. So a commitment to observation, which we see here in sort of preparatory drawings, um, perhaps sketches out in the world that he would make um, in preparation for his paintings. Um, and uh, so they're reviving the practice of working from life, right? Focusing on, um, uh, the craft of art uh, that's very different, right? That's grittier, that's more observation-based than uh, those elegant court painters like Michelangelo um, that came before them. Um, and that sort of tireless observation is really essential um, to caricature. Um, and uh, so that's sort of, we see both sort of observation and sort of exaggeration playfully, you know, humorously in a, a painting like this, um, in these two laughing youths. Um, it's also just a painting that we um, enjoy <laughs> standing in front of um, with these two figures. Um, and the sort of complexity of the naturalism on display here, right? Um, these, uh, these strange expressions would have uh, posed just, just an exciting challenge to the artists in training that would have copied it. And if caricature was established in the Western tradition by Karachi and his circle, um, this uh, print from the Gilbert collection represents the sort of golden age or pinnacle of caricature um, in, uh, in Europe in the 19th century. Um, this is, there are many really fantastic prints, especially by the artist Daumier, who you see here, and Granville, um, uh, who Gilbert also collected. Um, these were two artists that worked together for um, the publication Charivari, um, which was edited in the 19th century by Charles Philippon. Um, and this uh, journal specialized in political caricatures um, until 1835 when um, caricatures that were political in nature or challenged the um, uh, the king um, were uh, outlawed. And in fact, Daumier, the artist you see on the screen, um, was put in prison for six months um, in the 1830s for an image offensive to the king. Um, so there was this sort of back and forth throughout the 19th century um, uh, where censorship laws were, were loosened and then tightened up again. Um, and this caricature is, is not a political work. Um, this is uh, a cartoon mocking two hunters um, who encounter each other um, outdoors and are sort of asking, oh, you know, uh, how are you? How is your aunt? You know, um, hopefully she's not suffering any longer from her cold. Oh, she's cured completely, you know. Um, and then sort of parenthetically at the bottom, the text tells you that the partridges that they're supposed to be hunting are also enjoying, you know, flourishing health. So this is a joke about, you know, the sort of bourgeois, these bourgeois manners that are getting in the way of this sort of adventurous um, hunt. Um, but just because this is a social satire, sort of mocking these two men, um, doesn't mean it's not sort of connected to contemporary um, events. Uh, hunting was restricted to the aristocracy. So you had to be sort of part of this, you know, 
formalized um, sector of society until 1830 um, when the privilege was expanded. So this was a very new middle-class hobby in the 1850s when Daumier mocks it. And that's one of the things he sort of enthusiastically mocked was, were these um, sort of bumbling middle-class pursuits. Um, and we see uh, this is a lithograph and you see the really sort of loose facile marks of the artist. Um, he worked on a stone with, with a sort of waxy crayon. Um, so you see a very loose hand. It'll be, it'll look different than some of the etchings um, in the collection here. Um, and we, I think we both especially love this print. Um, there are many Daumiers on the wall um, because of the way the dogs, you know, really mimic their owners, right? Both in their greetings and in their, in their looks. So, um, you know, as I tell my students all the time, you know, it's, it's hard to find a new joke, right? <laughs> this is an old joke um, that Daumier uh, shows us here that we've certainly seen since. Okay, we have uh, two more works to show you. Um, and uh, we wanted to show you one of the uh, two Rembrandts that are on display in the exhibition. This particular one is a reclining woman. Uh, it's a later impression on paper from an original from 1658. Um, and there are large numbers of uh, prints uh, in the exhibition. So we wanted to show you one that has a real interesting uh, kind of technical uh, kind of uh, uh, sophistication to it. Uh, this reclining woman that we see from behind is a study uh, likely of Rembrandt's partner after the death of his wife Saskia. He took up with uh, Hendrike Stoffels, who was a woman who appears in a lot of his later works. So this is thought to date to Rembrandt's what is called his fourth Amsterdam period. Um, and so this particular work I think is most interesting in the way he combines etching and dry point. Um, very often Rembrandt combined different printmaking uh, techniques to achieve the kind of richness and uh, subtlety of light and dark contrasts, and even we can say some coloristic effects, though there's no color in them, that we equate with painting. Uh, and so he uses dry point, um, and these are prints that were made on copper plates, but what he did with dry point to get these very, very dark areas was to leave the burrs as the copper is, um, is sort of uh, carved out with these very uh, sharp um, uh, uh, tools, you would kind of dig into the copper uh, and then it leaves those filings or burrs, right? And normally those were sanded off, but he left them that created kind of rough edges to his lines. And then when you ink these plates, the ink will just pool into the edges. And so it gives it a much looser quality than what we equate with uh, printmaking, uh, engraving, which is a very sharp, clear line. Uh, so later prints um, were covered with a waxy surface and then artists would carve with a stylus just into the wax itself and then uh, have the lines burned through. So it was uh, less of a physically difficult kind of technique, but Rembrandt was really known for all of his techniques. Uh, we begin with wood carving and then uh, engraving, etching, dry point, but to combine those together into one image uh, was something that really shows his technical sophistication. So you can see the hatch marks in the upper left corner uh, that go crossways against each other to create that darkness. And then on the right uh, bottom, where it's lighter, you see the blanket and the pillow that just have these lines. These lines give this incredible texture to the pillow and give depth to this particular work. So when you see the exhibition, take a careful look at a lot of the prints that are throughout each of the different themes and rooms of the collection. So we have one final work. And it's a really wonderful print, another wonderful print from the collection. Um, Creighton Gilbert curated a show at the uh, Height Art Institute at the University of Kentucky 
Um, when he was there, he curated the show from 1947 to 48 um, of prints by this artist, uh, Mauricio Lasansky. Um, so that's probably where he came into contact with this work. And we can see then that that his uh, collecting practice at this moment is utterly contemporary, right? He's collecting a, an artwork that was made, you know, the, the year or the year before um, that he acquired it. Um, uh, My Boy is one of a series of idealized portraits of Lasansky's family. Um, and uh, Lasansky was born in Argentina to a Jewish family. His family had emigrated from Eastern Europe. Um, and so, of course, in 1947, we see this as a kind of powerful response to the horrors um, of war that he was feeling um, quite acutely to the atrocities um, uh, that he would later document in a series uh, uh, called the Nazi Drawings, in, for which he's probably most famous um, in 1966, uh, drawings which became part of the first exhibit of um, um, at the new Whitney Museum um, in New York City, uh, along with a, a couple of other artists. Um, so Lasansky is quite um, important. Um, and this work is, is an interesting sort of first, first turn um, to, as a response to um, the atrocities of the Second World War. Um, and his response, right, is to sort of, um, uh, is to turn to the domestic, is to turn to one of his sons, one of his six children. Um, his children ended up becoming sculptors, art professors, dancers, printers. Um, and Lysansky, uh uh, not only joined the, the collection of the Whitney Museum, but he um, established the School of Printmaking at the University of Iowa, where he worked for 40 years. Um, at, and he had just joined it in 1945. So we see this really sort of prescient um, acquisition uh, by Creighton Gilbert in 1947-48. Uh, and, and the print itself is interesting too. The artist used five copper plates in the printing of this large-scale print. It's, it's you know, fairly monumental um, in person um, and, uh, and was known to be a kind of innovator for the creation of these uh, large scale metal plate uh, prints. Um, so we end on this image because it really shows the breadth of uh, Creighton Gilbert's collecting practice, um, you know, from um, the sort of old masterworks to this really contemporary material. So if anyone has any questions, we are happy to answer. I just have a few comments I'm going to make, but mm -hmm. um, I want to invite all of our attendees to feel free to type a question into the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. And I want to thank you, Erin and Allison. That was really interesting. And um, especially getting to know a little bit more about each of these works and the exhibition. Um, which we've lived with for a little while, but, but that was really a treat to hear more in depth about um, some of the works that you chose. Um, so please feel free. Um, our attendees can, can type questions into the Q&A box. In the meantime, I just wanted to, to um, say hello and welcome to a couple of special attendees we have joining us. Um, Eric Lee is here, David Byron is here, and Stephen Gilbert. And then also Peter uh, Van de Mortel, who was one of the, um, well, who is the chief conservator at the Kimball and who worked on a number of the works in the exhibition is here today. In fact, um, it's, it's his conservation report that, that we've pulled from in part um, and shared next to the Romanino. And so uh, Peter, if you would like to, if you'd like to make any comments about what it was like to work on that painting or any of the paintings in this collection in general, um, we'd love to hear from you. You can type your, um, your comments into the Q&A box or I, I believe you can unmute yourself and, and join us um, in, the, in, the, in the call. We do have a question here that just came in. What was Creighton Gilbert's personal life like? I think that's a question that Stephen Gilbert might best be able to mm -hmm. answer, but I'll, um, I'll let our panelists take a stab at it. Um, 
Well, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I think Stephen would be a, a better, uh, at, and also uh, David, too, who spoke um, in his uh, biography about how he was sort of an eclectic, kind of uh, unusual character on, on campus at Yale. He was a very rigorous uh, instructor, uh, and um, but a very different kind of a personality. And I myself wondered, you know, about that. I mean, he has this incredible kind of background as a child. And so um, it, when you look at that journal and see how exacting he was and writing out his daily schedule and talking about the art in such an incredible kind of descriptive way and then seeing him you know some of the uh, alumni or students of his kind of describe his teaching in the same way those are the kinds of things we unearthed uh, as we were looking him up but in terms of just him as a person as a personality I would love to uh, to have known him and be able to speak about that because I've kind of wondered that myself I'd like to have just five minutes with him with a lot of questions um, but if uh, anyone on here could uh, make some comments about that I would I would love to hear them Yes, yeah, Stephen. If you're if you're um, still on the call, we've given I you. I am. Oh, great! We've given you the ability to speak. <laughs> Good. Well, he was a very, very uh, concentrated scholar. He didn't have what most people would call a personal life. He never married. He never even had a driver's license. Wow. He was. Um, he lived monkishly. I guess you could say, uh, we, uh, th that is, I and the, the other members of my nuclear family uh, saw him occasionally. We lived out in the suburbs of New York and in, in Morristown, but we never visited him in New York where he had an apartment for decades, never once. We didn't even know where it was. Wow. He was devoted to his work. Uh, most people, I imagine, you know, we we uh, divide our lives. We say, well, we have we're married, we have kids. He was, as far as I could tell, a ninety-hour-a-week man from um, his twenties until uh, old age. He was that kind of man. He was he was really a, an impossibly hard worker. Um, he was editor of the art journal, uh, Art Bulletin, it is, I think, for a couple of years, on top of his research projects, his teaching, dissertation supervision. He was an amazing man, but he did that by sacrificing what most people would call a personal life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wondered that because it's incredible how many publications he has. Uh, it's incredible how, how many, you know, he was on Art Bulletin and he traveled so much. And I just wondered how he was able to achieve all that. But I think you're right. It's, it's you know, he was so dedicated. So that's interesting. More than 200 articles and 12 books published. Yeah, incredible. He paid a high price for that. I think that's reasonable to say. Mm -hmm. He was, he, he lived alone. Uh, he was not, he, he was socially um, odd in that he just didn't um, have uh, close, close relations as you would normally think of people as having. Mm -hmm. He was uh, dedicated to his books, to his scholarship. That was his source of meaning in life. Mm -hmm. And his, his early career was so nomadic as it is for many academics, right? He moved from university to university, you know, progressively sort of impressive universities. Um, but during the, you know, one's thirties and forties, he, he was really on the move. So it must've been difficult in that way too. Yeah. Well, he was at Indiana. He was at Louisville, as you said, uh, Ringling for a year or so, uh, then Brandeis, Cornell for a while. For I think 10 years, he was at um, Queens College here in New York. Mm -hmm. That's why he had an apartment here, but he kept it after that, after he moved on, mm -hmm. even when he was at Cornell and then later at Yale. So were his paintings, his collection, was that in New York or 
No, he had a condo in West Haven, mm -hmm. Connecticut, uh, right outside of New Haven. Mm -hmm. uh, not owning a car, he chose his apartment well, right near a bus stop. The bus took him right to the center of New Haven and to Yale. Mm -hmm. He had everything uh, there. He had nothing in his apartment in New York, mm -hmm. nothing at all. Mm -hmm. That had, it was just bare walls. Mm -hmm. yeah, sterile. Yeah. Hmm. We have a few questions. I think I'll ask. And Stephen, will you will you stay on the? <laughs> sure, I'm. I'm line? here. I'm here. I, I think you could probably uh, weigh in on these as well. Um, Aaron has asked. I love a different Aaron. Sorry, um, that she loves that he has an interest in collecting unattributed works. Is there anything in the collection that you came across in your research that Creighton was able to make an attribution for that seemed really exciting for him? Like one of those, she says, oh my gosh, I have a long lost Caravaggio here. <laughs> <laughs> we know he was proud of the Romanino. Yes. And the piazza, he did a lot of, and we didn't show the Callisto Piazza um, today, but that's one of the major works uh, in the collection. When you walk into the uh, exhibition, that's where we talk about the frame. It has a beautiful 19th century replica frame, but he did a lot of work on piazza as well. So he was trying to flesh out his understanding of these various different artists, their lives and styles to really see if these attributions worked, um, not only just for the artists themselves, but even for the subjects, there's a lot of them, you know, where he was trying to figure out the subject of works of art. There's one that's in the allegory section, which is, a, it's a fragment that is probably of a religious work, but he was trying to figure out that subject too. Um, and so I think between the Romanino and the Piazza, those are the, uh, probably the, the, the ones that were the most interesting, I would say. The Piazza kind of stops you in your tracks, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Tomoko has asked, when this collection was shown in 2017, the exhibition focused, it, well, I should, I should back up and qualify that. There was a selection of prints and drawings, works on paper from the collection that was exhibited upstairs in our mezzanine gall gallery in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, but she says the exhibit focused more on the Northern Renaissance, Durer, Rembrandt, etc. Did Gilbert have particular thoughts about the Southern versus Northern Renaissance? And actually, I was kind of thinking about this when you were speaking, um, I think, Allison, that it's interesting that he was collecting, he was writing or researching about the South, but collecting Northern artists. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess I didn't quite realize that. Yeah, in terms of his, his collecting of Italian works, mo the, the prints of his are... Uh, Lucas van Leiden, you know, Rembrandt, a lot, they're Northern artists, but the print, printmaking medium was more prominent in Northern Europe. Um, but his painting collecting was Italian, Italian Renaissance, 1400s, 1500s, which was his main area. But it is interesting that most of the paintings he collected are Northern Italian. Um, the area around Venice and that Cremona, Crema, Lombardy, Brescia, all of those towns keep coming up uh, in the research that he's doing. So, so yeah, I found that very interesting too. And I also, David, I think I just allowed you to be able to speak as well. David is, David Byron was one of Stephen, excuse me, one of Creighton Gilbert's students who has also written um, a biography of, of much of his life. David, did you have something you wanted to add? I'm sorry. Yes, I think I can shed a little bit of light on the issue of North versus South or North with South in Creighton's thinking, because uh, although we tend, I think, to think of Creighton Gilbert as uh, a Michelangelo scholar and a central Italian scholar, his very first uh, studies were of the North and uh, North Central Italian environment and his dissertation was uh, also on a topic from that region and indeed the very first class that I took with him was also on northern Italy and the reason for this is that from his earliest years to one of his final books in the 90s he was pursuing uh, an understanding of the origins of Caravaggio and Caravaggesque art as having been influenced by northern European art through these transalpine artists and influences drawing uh, insights into naturalism from the North and then applying them in an Italian idiom. 
And so I think for that reason, I, we can say two things that might be of interest here. One is that the Romanina was probably quite special to him because it touched on both his earliest fascinations with a particular art historical problem that he pursued in depth, and also hearkened back decades later to what we might see as the one thread in his many research interests that he kept tugging at, and, and which finally culminated in his great book, Caravaggio and his two cardinals, which among other things is an exploration of where on earth Caravaggio came from. And his views on this did run a little bit contrary to some of the received wisdom insofar as he saw Caravaggio not as a stark, shocking revolutionary, but as a very Raphael-esque artist who had adopted some Northern-like tendencies that were already well in play in the environment in which he grew up. Mm. Mm. I'm going to allow Eric Lee to talk as well, if you'd like to add on. Eric, there's another question that I think you might want to respond to also. Um, but if you're still on the line, you are... Um, we've, Great. We've, we've I'd be happy to. Can you hear me? Am I muted? Yeah. No, 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 we can hear you. Okay, great. What, what's the question? Well, the previous question was about... Um, um, now I have to go back to North, North versus South. South. Well, I did want to mention also that um, his scholarly work was not focused entirely on Central Italian art. His dissertation uh, was on the Northern artist Savoldo. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he completed it in 1955. Right. But it was, yes. uh, it, 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 so he had an interest in Northern Northern Italian art and his scholarly work as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, Stephen Gilbert's um, descriptions of what, what he was like personally, I think he absolutely hit the nail on the head. Um, his life from what I gather, um, he, he, he seemed very much to lead a monkish sort of life. I went to his apartment in West Haven once to see the collection. And, uh, and art was all over the place. Um, paintings leaning on the uh, walls, sit, uh, resting on the floors, leaning on the walls. And uh, he, uh, I, 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 Monk is exactly what, uh, what came to mind. His office uh, in the art history department at Yale always had one or two paintings, um, again, sitting on the floor, resting on the walls. I think he was researching them, and uh, but um, uh, yes, I, I think that Stephen Gilbert absolutely hit the nail on the head. He was a bit of a mystery, um, uh, personally, but to I everyone. think his life was entirely <laughs> devoted to his work. He had a brilliant mind, an absolutely brilliant mind, and uh, he was my dissertation advisor, and uh, uh, I, I off sometimes question. Uh, some of his, his, his comments about my work, but I think he always ended up being correct. Uh, and, and I always found that he was correct. He liked very much to be right. <laughs> and he usually was. I That's right, say. quite so. He had reasons for saying what he did. He was always ready to do that. And they were usually devastatingly potent. <laughs> it, it was annoying in that way. <laughs> I also, he, he didn't use a computer. He, he typed out his notes and letters. Would not touch them. A you absolutely. Yeah. And I was so pleased here at the Kimball earlier this week, uh, my assistant found an old letter from, from Creighton to a previous uh, former director here at the Kimball. And uh, it, it just, it brought back so many memories. So it was, it was typed out on his, his old uh, typewriter. And then the notes that were scribbled around the letter, is ex I've seen so many letters like that from, from him. But uh, yes, he was a very interesting man, brilliant mind, absolutely brilliant mind, completely devoted to, uh, to his work. Uh, I Eric, was that letter to Edmund Pillsbury? Uh, yes, it, it was. Yes, he considered, he considered Pillsbury one of his good friends and often spoke about him when we were together. I just wanted to add that one of, you know, we, we took a lot of delight in going through the archival ma materials that Stephen that you sent and some of Good. the 
some of the uh, materials that we reproduced and put on the wall um, were rejection letters where, where uh, Creighton had written um, you know, why these articles should not be published. And then the authors had written to him, thanking him for his, you know, scathing review of their work. <laughs> because he gave good reasons, yeah, presumably. Yeah, he gave good reasons. That's exactly right. Um, I have a, uh, here's a question, really, Eric, I think that you can field. Um, and I'm going to combine two questions into one, really. Mary asks that she, that what was his connection to Oklahoma and to OU? And Tomoko wonders, what was his intention or his idea behind donating his collection to OU? And I think really probably you are maybe the best. Well, um, uh, he had been my dissertation advisor, as I mentioned earlier. And when I became director of the Fred Jones, um, I invited him to come out and speak a couple of times. And, uh, and so um, he came out to Oklahoma, um, gave fantastic lectures, and, uh, and then he decided that um, his collection would be of, of great use to the students at OU. And, and, um, and so he decided to, to give the collection there. I think he thought it, it, would, uh, it would find a better home at the Fred Jones than say at the Yale Art Gallery, which is so extremely rich. Uh, and, um, and so I thought, I, he thought he, he could make more of a difference, I believe, in Oklahoma than- And, um, and there was a reason for that. I think uh, as I, it's only a vague message, but he thought that art should not be concentrated in just a few places within the country. He said that, People in Oklahoma should not have to go to New York in order to see Raphael. Mm -hmm. uh, Duro should be available in other parts of the country. He, he was not, uh, he, I think he was suspicious of a kind of elitism in the distribution of art. I think that played a role in his thinking as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and he did a study um, at one point where he broke down the number of old master paintings city by city throughout the United States. Oh, really? To kind I didn't of analyze yeah. their, their distribution. And as someone who teaches, you know, artworks from his collection here, I'm so appreciative he added to this collection. Mm -hmm. um, here is another question. Aaron asks, I'm also curious about the drapery that shows in the infrared of the Romanino. Is that drapery still visible in the restored piece? I don't remember it from the first look at the work, if it is now visible. And I was, I was thinking that was just a dark slide, but... Um... Do you want me to go back? Oh, sure. Yeah, if we can... So the drapery, yeah, if we go back there, is that um, the drapery on the, is it the Christ child that you can barely see that uh, or is it the Virgin's Drapery? I thought she meant in the background, but I might be mistaken. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, mm -hmm. because you've got, well, see, some of that is water, I think. Um, uh, or I'm not sure if that's drape. Well, it's hard to tell. I'm not sure if that's drapery per se, or, or if that's just when the varnish is stripped off the, uh, the kind of wood. Um, um, we'll have, I'd have to look at the conservation report for that a little bit more, but I think it's just a tenebristic background. I know that Creighton saw this painting as the most important in his collection, and he was so proud of uh, acquiring this. Mm. It was in a Sotheby's Arcade auction, unattributed in New York. He spotted it. He knew it was Romanino right away, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he bought it. And uh, yes, he turned out to it turned out to be Romanino. There's no question about the attribution. Yeah. Um, it was not in great condition, but uh, Peter van der Mortel here at the Kimball um, has brought it back to life. And uh, it was so exciting um, seeing the XRFs and X-rays and mm -hmm. infrareds with this and and the changes that Romanino made with with uh, with Saint Jerome here. Mm -hmm. um, the image that you brought up, you can't see um, uh, how he changes. Um, it's not terribly clear the right. change made to his face, mm -hmm. but uh, but you know, when you look closer, it's perfectly obvious 
that Romanino completely reworked his face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a thumbnail on the panel in the gallery where you, you get another view um, and the, the nose is down kind of just above the Christ figure's head. <laughs> And mm -hmm. the, it's quite different than this composition. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's 420 and we don't have any more questions. I wonder, Stephen, Eric, David, Allison, Aaron, if you have anything else you'd like to add? Well, I'd just like to say it's been a wonderful presentation. You've done a great job and I can't wait to see the exhibition. My, uh, my sentiments also. Well, thank you all. Thank you, you. you all have been really helpful, and it's so nice to talk with you on this webinar, and I look forward to mm -hmm. meeting you all in person in the fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on that on that note, I, I will add um, that I hope all of you save the date. So on Friday, November 19th at 9.30 a.m., Allison and Aaron will be participating in our popular informal Zoom program, Coffee with the Collection, and they will be discussing... Um, probably a favorite work or some interesting tidbits um, about works in this particular collection. That's at 9.30 in the morning on November 19th over Zoom. And you can go ahead and registrar for, <laughs> registrar, register for that, um, for that program on our website. And then also I hope you will save the date and we're looking at maybe early October at this point, but it will be a fall celebration kind of midway through the exhibition. Uh, the exhibition runs through uh, December 31st this year, but we'll have an in-person um, gathering and also um, probably a Zoom component for anyone who can't make it from afar. And we hope to bring in um, former students and, and scholars to that program. So I hope you'll save the date. We'll announce that very soon. And then also, if you can't make it to the exhibition yet, or you would like to tour it virtually, we have um, a virtual tour available on our website and there should be a link in the chat window so you can um, go directly to it from, from this um, program. And that will let you walk through the gallery and then look closely at, at some of the images that are in the exhibition. Um, Thanks, Celeste. Okay, great, yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll also make this Zoom program available um, on YouTube and we'll send a link out to that as soon as it's posted as well. So I want, to, I want to take a moment to thank Allison and Aaron for their work curating this exhibition. I really want to thank Stephen, David, and Eric, especially for the help that you've given and the roles that you've had in bringing this collection to Oklahoma, which I think is a benefit not only to the museum, but more importantly to the students and to the community that surrounds it here in Norman. Um, echo as Creighton intended. Yes, as mm -hmm. intended. Um, so, and I think it's a gorgeous exhibition. I think our prep department did a really wonderful job with this. They did a so great job hanging up. You all see it. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>